The message uh, this morning is entitled, I Just Can't Understand the Bible. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I just can't understand the Bible. And uh, our Bible text comes from 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I think I told her wrong earlier. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we want to look at verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. Accurately, I want you to underline that word, accurately, handling the word of truth. I just can't understand the Bible, you hear a lot of people. Are you kidding me? I mean, most people can't understand the Bible because they can't, they don't read it. Right? They don't read it. They seldom pick up a Bible. How could you possibly know what the Bible says if you don't read it? And look at the competition that's in our, in our life today. I mean, we got satellite TV and beaming in. We got 350 channels to, to 1,000. And we got thousands of movies to rent, to own, to buy, and, and all these things. Uh, you know, when I first, back in the early 80s, I, back in, some of you young people probably don't know what a VHS tape looks like, do you? Remember how revolutionary it was to VHS? And then up pop all the stores. I mean, we had stores on every corner. And uh, you could go in, rent videos and everything. And I mean, you could sit down. And uh, I had a couple in our church at that time who, uh, you know, they, they weren't at church and, uh, several times. And, and so I asked them, you know, what, what happened to you this Sunday or whatever? And they said, well, we rented a couple of movies last night. And, and, uh, and we kind of overslept. What I found out is they rented three or four movies last night. Do you know how long it takes to watch three or four movies in one night? I mean, they had to have been up till four or five o'clock in the morning. I mean, we got all kinds of things that are taking us away from the Word of God. And people are crazy. I mean, we've got all kinds of things that we can watch and see and do. And, and sports keeps people from reading the Bible. And family and friends sometimes keep people from reading the Bible. you got romance novels and other novels that keep people from reading the Bible. People are busy, busy, busy entertaining themselves. It just doesn't include this book right here. And people are busy in their lives. I, I admit that. You know, we're zipping through life at Mach 5 and we're trying to do this and we're trying to do that. And seldom does most people crack open the Bible anymore, let alone have any knowledge of what it's all about. And I'm not going to ask. And when they do go to church, they might not even bring it. I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not trying to get on to anybody. I'm just stating some facts here. And that's the truth. Am I, am I telling any lies here? People don't understand the Bible because they never pick up the Bible. And it's as true as that. And so where do they get their information? I was kind of thinking about, you know, if they don't read the Bible, where, where's people getting the information about what they believe, about these deep theological thoughts about what happens when we die and what's the promise of, for the believer and who God is? Where do people come up with this stuff? Well, so if they go to church, they listen to some preacher, but they don't back up what he has to say. They don't study the Bible for themselves. They've been maybe programmed to believe some myths or lies that have come from Platoism has corrupted the church about who God is and what happens when we die and the hope of the believer and the resurrection. Most people don't know much about the kingdom of God. Remember that song by Sam Cooke in the 60s? Don't know much about history. Most people don't know much about the kingdom of God in the age and the time that we live in. They have never studied church history. They have never, uh, they haven't got a clue about where the, some of these false teachings have come from. They haven't got a clue about what the Jews believed before uh, New Testament Christianity. They haven't got a clue about who God really is and about death. 
and the resurrection because these things are being told in a different way in so many other mediums that are far from the Word of God. So where do they get their theological understanding from? It might be from preachers that they, they have listened to. They might get their theological knowledge from TV evangelists, and that can be troublesome. It might be books that they have read, and these may be books that are known to be fiction. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of books that were written on the Left Behind series, and there's some, there's some good stuff in that. I'll, I'll admit that Jesus is coming back, and some of the things said are true, but there's a lot of misinformation in those books as well. It may be from mom and dad what they believed. Grandma or grandpa. Traditions of the church. Uh, and you have to just wonder. You know. When we find out. That these things such as infant baptism. Worshiping Mary. The Trinity. Purgatory. Uh, and a lot of other stuff have, I mean, you just, it's not there. It's simply not there. And so, and if they don't get it from that, then they, they go on what their friends have told them. Or maybe a Christian radio station or song that they really, really like. And, and some of the music is just beautiful. And there's a lot of truth in them as well. But there's a lot of false doctrine in those songs too. Some people get their full understanding of the Bible from, if they can't find it anywhere else, it's from Hollywood. I mean, here's Hollywood, here's the Bible, which one are you going to believe? You know, there are your choices, right? And, uh, and of course, uh, the latest movie is uh, like the one we have now, Heaven is Real. And I know heaven is real because we know that's where God is. The sun sits at the right hand of the throne of God. The angels of heaven are, are there. Heaven is a real place. Jesus is interceding for our sins when we pray. Uh, he's uh, the man, Jesus, between God and man. Heaven is a place where Jesus went to prepare a place for us that when he comes again, we will be with him. John chapter 14, verse 3. Heaven is a real place where the holy city, the new Jerusalem, it's a heavenly city that we're told in Revelation 21, verse 1 through 3, will come down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband, and then the tabernacle of God is among men, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Heaven is a real, real place. And why did Jesus say in John 3.13, no one has gone into heaven? I mean, it's there. And yet we know that the Word of God says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So someday heaven will be on earth, or the kingdom of God will be on this planet. And it will be a fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy and the interpretation of of King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, that Jesus will be that stone cut out of the mountain without hands and will crush all the other kingdoms. And we're told in Revelation 5.10 that we will be priests of God, of Christ, and will reign with Him in the kingdom of God on the earth. I just can't understand the Bible, a lot of people say, and it's because they've never picked it up and they've never read the Bible. And I'm saying today, don't believe what I'm saying. Study the Bible for yourself on these topics, and you'll find truth. So if you can't figure out what the Bible says, there's a lot of confusion in Christianity today. And it's kind of like uh, military double speak. We're going to play a little quiz now, and you tell me what I'm talking about. A rotating wing aircraft suffered a hard landing due to the stress failure of a helicopter 
hexaform rotating compression device. What am I talking about? Anybody know? In a military double speak, that is a helicopter that crashed because a bolt broke. And that's how the Bible is for a lot of people. They just can't understand the Bible. And I'll admit, there are some things that are hard to understand. What is the Bible all about? I just can't understand the Bible. Well, I grew up in Sunday school like many of you did in church. Listen, went to all the camps and all the Bible schools. And, and clearly there's much to learn about the Bible. And I studied it. But I didn't really study in depth until I got to Bible college. And, and so in my ministry, I've tried to present those, some of those classes that meant a lot to me to understand the Bible more fully and clearer than I had before. Because we know all the stories. I mean, we know the stories about Daniel and the lion's den. We know the story of Samson. And we know all these stories that are in the Bible. But they just kind of run together and they kind of lump together. And, and uh, we don't know which came first and which came second. And, and uh, we have no idea. But one of the most important classes I ever took in Bible college was my freshman year. It's called Bible Survey. And it helped me understand the Bible in a clear and a much better way than I'd ever known it before. Now, for someone who went to Sunday school all their life, attended Bible school, went to camp, uh, if I was still a little bit wondering about some things, I'm sure a lot of you are as well. And so this message, uh, it may or may not be for you, but it's a, a simple message. We had some visitors the other day, and, and uh, I was hoping that person might be here today. But we kind of want to understand what the Bible is all about. And so I want to show you just a few things this morning that we can better understand the Bible. Because there is a lot of confusion in Christianity today. First of all, there are 66 books. They're written by 40 different authors. Did you realize that? Written over a period of between 1,500 and 2,000 years. That's a long time. And yet it all makes sense when you string it together. A lot of time our understanding of the Bible is like pearls on a string. Over four years, okay. We'll go for that. Uh... They're like pearls on a string, but these pearls are just all over the place. And without stringing them together one by one and understanding how they fit in chronological order, people are confused about some of these stories. And we've been studying a little bit about this on Wednesday night. Did you know that the Bible was written in basically three different languages? Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And there are books of history and prophecy and poetry and letters. And, uh, you know, we're supposed to read it and apply it to our modern everyday lives. It's not always as simple as it, it may seem. And uh, one of the first and most important classes I took was this Bible survey class. And we memorized uh, a group of people. And we worked on this Wednesday night, so hopefully you'll remember one of the first things we did was we tried to, to memorize these people because I think we get lost sometimes in the years. But uh, John Lewis was my instructor, and uh, he gave us a list of names in the Bible. And there's a, approximately, and this, this is not exact science by any means, but approximately 500 years to kind of give you an idea of the separation in time between all of them. And... Uh, these group of character, Bible characters that you're familiar with are Adam. If you're to put them in chronological order, Adam, Seth, Enoch, Noah, Abraham. Did you realize that all those are found in just the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis? Five of them. Adam, Seth, Enoch, Noah, Abraham. About 2,000 years covered in the book of Genesis. That's a lot of time. 
And then after that, we have Moses, David, Daniel, and Jesus. Did you realize there was that much separation in some of these characters? There's about a thousand years between Daniel or David and Jesus Christ. I mean, think about 500 years going back to today, you know, we're in the 1500s, right? I mean, that's a lot of time. And yet that uh, is a, a, about the time span between each and one, every one of these. And so when you're trying to understand the Bible, one of the most, because the, we, we look at the Bible in Bible survey from a bird's eye view. And it's like putting beads on a string. We're kind of tying all these things. And when you get to a, a book of the Bible, you want to understand who the author is. What was the historical time period it was written in? You know, what was going on in the rest of the world? You know, who was the world empire? Was it Assyria? Was it Babylon? Is it Rome? Was it uh, the Greeks? Uh, you would not want to know the setting and who was it written to. That's kind of important. And what was the main message? And so when you get into a serious Bible study and you're studying the Bible book, these are important things that you learn about what you're studying for. And when you understand that, and then you pull out a scripture, like Brother Terry pulled out Isaiah chapter 53, that was the time period that Isaiah lived, and the Assyrians were beaten down on, had already taken captive the northern empire, and they were already threatening to take over the southern empire, which was Judah. And you kind of understand then about Isaiah uh, and, you know, the hope that he wanted to bring to the people and this wonderful prophecy that we have. And this helped me a whole lot. And we also learned a little bit about the time separation and, uh, that we've been working on. And, but behind and beneath and above and beyond the Bible is God, the God of the Bible. I mean, it's all about God. We are told in Scripture that the Bible is God-given. It should be treasured. It should be kept. It is a lamp. It is food. If you'll turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verses 10 through 17. You know, sometimes we cover these things and we just assume everybody gets it. And even some of my own kids... You know, I assume they got all this stuff in Sunday school, and then they asked me a question, and I, you know, it kind of blows my mind. And, and, but, I, you know, that's probably more typical than untypical. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 10 says this, Now, you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, and love, and perseverance. Persecutions and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch at Iconium. And at Lystra, and the persecution that I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You might want to underline that. Because when you're having a bad time, or a bad day, or uh, things are getting bad for Christians, you might underline that and remember that. Verse 13, evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And and that has happened in Christianity since even before the apostles were dead. You, however, continue in the things that you've learned, become convinced of knowing and from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have learned the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom and leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Here is the key in this whole text here. In verse 16, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. It says a lot about the Word of God. The Word of God is uh, inspired by God. God breathes the Word of God. And so we can take it to the bank when we read God's Word for what it says. Now, of course, who, who's the author of the book of 2 Timothy? Anybody know? Anybody know? Paul wrote a letter to his son in the faith, Timothy, 
And who was the world empire at this time? It was the Romans. And they were, you know, I don't know if the, uh, Nero's persecution had begun, but they knew a lot about persecution already at this time because Paul eventually was beheaded in Rome uh, by, under the emperor Nero. So he knew uh, what he was talking about when he wrote this. Indeed, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ will be persecuted. He knew what he was talking about. And this is pro the, probably the last letter as Paul was on death row. Now, of all the things that he wanted to say, he writes in this letter, this is the last one getting out because he knows that his departure is coming. He is going to die. He knows he's going to be executed. Uh, but he tells us all Scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, training in righteousness, and the man of God may be adequate and equipped in every good work. Psalm 119 tells us also the importance of the Word of God. The book of Psalms. Did you know this was the, the Jewish hymn book? And it was written by several different uh, writers. David was one of them, but there were many others. Uh, and in this text we have, uh, I don't think I have time to read all this, but we'll read a little bit. How can a young man, verse 9... Keep his way pure by keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have told of all the ordinances of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies. And uh, in verse 16, I shall not forget your word. Uh, as we uh, go into verses 105 to... 117, we'll skip there. He says, Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path, and I have sworn and I will confirm it, and I will keep your righteous ordinances. And we'll, we'll stop with that. You can read on uh, as the importance of the word of God. All of God's word is inspired. It's God breathed. God speaking to us. And people wonder, does God speak to us today? Yes, he does. Through the Word of God and through our conscience, once we put on Christ through the waters of baptism. If you, are, if you feel guilty about something, it may be the Holy Spirit working on you saying that, yes, you're guilty. God speaks to us through His Word today, and He also speaks to us through His Holy Spirit. And you just know sometimes it, something is right. Or you just know Something is wrong because the Holy Spirit works upon us. The Old Testament was written mostly in Hebrew and Aramaic about 100 years before Christ was, it was translated into Greek. And the word Bible means books. The word Testament means covenant or agreement. The Old Testament was God's covenant made with, with people about their salvation before Christ came. Came. The old covenant. This is how you're to do it. This is how you're to be my people. This is our agreement. The New Testament is God's covenant made with people about their salvation after Christ. Hey, things are new. Under Christ, we're under a new covenant or new law. In the Old Testament, we find the covenant of the law. In the New Testament, we find the covenant of grace that came through Jesus Christ. And one led us to another. If you look at Galatians chapter 3 and verses 17 through 25. I had my watch upside down. I thought, man, I'm just getting started. It's 1130. Little did I know. One led to the other. Galatians chapter 3, verses 17 through 25. The Old Testament gathers around the... Mount Sinai. But the New Testament, it gathers around Mount Calvary and the cross. The Old Testament is associated with Abraham and, and Moses, but the New Testament is all about Jesus. Galatians 
told us about the promise that if we are Christ, if we are Christ, then we are also of the seed of Abraham. And those promises that were given to Abraham are given to us. That's the Abrahamic covenant given to us. And what was that all about? Genesis chapter 12, it was about the land, the kingdom that was to come. And we might just turn there, Galatians chapter, eh, let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I want to do my best to get all this in here this morning. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 16. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place that he had received as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise, and looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah, you know, we'll skip that verse. Going down to uh, uh, verse 13, it says, And all of these died without receiving the promises, and having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So, Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, we don't know if it was Paul or not, because we're a little bit of a question about who the authorship is of Hebrews. But all of these, all of them, they looked for the city whose builder and architect was God. The holy city, the new Jerusalem. And we're told plainly that they all died in faith without receiving those promises. And if you look at the last two verses in the book of Hebrews, you'll find out why. He said, and all these having gained approval through their faith did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. But God, he you got a better plan. I mean, St. Peter's not walking through the pearly white gates and he's not going to greet anybody and tell the kingdom of God. When Jesus comes, you find that over in Revelation chapter 21. But all these died in faith. And, the, and, and what, what better plan did God have? It was that together with them we'll be made perfect. Apart from them, apart from us, they would not be made perfect because God had planned something better for us. Amen? I mean, that's kind of important stuff. From Adam to Abraham, we have the history of the human race. I mean, it right there in the book of Genesis. From Abraham to Christ, we have the history of the chosen race, which was the history of Israel. From Christ to the, uh, uh, from the New Testament, we have from Christ to the history of the church. The authors of the Bible were kings, they were princes, they were poets, they were philosophers, they were prophets, they were statesmen. The Old Testament tells us Messiah is coming. And the four Gospels, and I'm glad there's four of them, so we have a clear picture. They're about the life of Christ. They say somebody, the Messiah is here. Here he is. The promised Messiah has finally come. Here he is. And in the book of Acts and all the rest of the letters that are written after that, it says, Messiah is coming again. You want to know what? The Gospel of John was all about, if you go to John chapter 20 and verse 30 and 31, I think this is one of the most important texts in all of John. Tells us why he wrote the book. Why did John write this book? Why did he feel necessary to write a fourth Gospel? Verse 30 of chapter 20 says, Therefore many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. Might be in the other three. But these have been written so that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, 
The Son of God. Now he could have corrected it right here and said God the Son. That you will believe that Jesus is the Christ. That he is the Messiah. He is the Anointed One. He is the Son of God, not God the Son. And that by believing you may have life in his name. In the book of Acts, Paul's letters... Uh, Paul's letters, John, Jude, they're saying he's coming back. In the book of Acts chapter 1, we already talked about this a couple weeks ago, but what did Jesus do during the 40 days after his resurrection? He taught them about the coming kingdom of God. So when the thief on the cross was saying, Will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus said, Today I say this to you. It's all where you put the comma, by the way. You will be with me in paradise. He was talking about the paradise of the kingdom of God. You've got to go back to the question. Lord, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Now, did Jesus go into his kingdom that day? Absolutely not. Did paradise appear that day? Absolutely not. Jesus is the only hope for this world. and Someday he will usher in the kingdom of God when he comes. If you were to sum up the entire Bible in one verse, here it is. John 3.16. It's been called the Bible in miniature. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That, my friends, is the story of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, it's God's story of love and redemption. It's about how his people messed up a long time ago in the first garden. The garden of paradise when Adam and Eve lived. And the very first prophecy in the Bible, you know where it's found? Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. We see in Genesis the creation, we see man at peace in the garden, and then we see the fall of man, and then finally the curse. In verse 15 of Genesis chapter 3, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He, as the prophecy of the Messiah, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. He's talking to, to the serpent here in this text. You know, even though he'll bruise you on the heel, or Satan will bruise Christ on the heel. The Messiah will come. And the only way to kill a snake, the best way to kill a snake, what happens if you start shooting the 22 at his tail? But if you stomp on its head, he's going to be dead. And that's what this prophecy is about. Satan is going to get a piece of man at the beginning. He even got a piece of Christ at the crucifixion. But when the Messiah comes again, he will bruise you on the head. In Genesis we see creation, we see man, the Garden of Eden, the fall of man because of sin. We see the beginning of God's plan of redemption. In Revelation, we see the Garden of Eden, paradise that Jesus promised when Messiah has come. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Today I say this, you'll be with me in paradise. And you, all you've got to do is go over to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21, we're, we're going to wrap this up really quick here and you see in, in, in 
Revelation 21 and, and also chapter 22, we see the Garden of Eden restored. I'm, I'm not going to read it. I'm out of time. But from Genesis to Revelation, one complete story of God's love for the world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. Notice that word perish. That word perish means destroyed. Utterly and completely destroyed. And that will happen at the second death. But we'll have eternal life. The Bible really isn't that hard to understand. It might be confusing understanding the time and all the history and everything that goes along with it. You know, most people's knowledge of history is like the string of pearls. You just pick them up one by one and you put a string in them and you tie it all together. And hopefully through this message, through Bible study, through Bible survey, to the class we're having on Wednesday night, you can start picking up the, the pearls in Scripture and string them in order from Genesis to Revelation so you can think how incredible this story is. Here is a book, 15 to 2,000 years it was written, 40 different authors, and it all fits. That, my friends, is the real miracle. And how precious the Word of God is. That it's light for our lives. It is food that we eat. And it brings eternal life.